So I really would like to thank everybody for joining me today with this presentation. Um, and uh, we're really excited to talk about my favorite thing in the world, which is ANSYS <laughs> and uh, using simulation in the ANSYS world. So the, the whole point of this talk is what the title says, sec securing success in a startup with simulation. So really how to get to market faster and with a better by leveraging the capabilities that exist in simulation. So I'm getting all my stuff set up here so I can see your chats and everything. So a little bit of introduction to begin with. First of all, I wanna talk about ANSYS Inc. Um, that is the software tool that is used to, uh, as their slogan says, realize your product promise. So you've made a certain promise as to what your product will do. And one of the best ways to realize that is through the simulation through ANSYS. Uh, a lot of people don't realize they're the market leader. They're three times larger than their closest competitor. And they have a significant financial commitment to deliver value to their customers. Uh, with, they have 75 locations, over 2,700 employees in 40 different countries. Um, what we're here to talk about today to a large extent is their startup program. They have over 325, it's probably 330 startups globally uh, part of this program and growing. So this has been a really successful program. And one of the things that sets ANSYS apart compared to other people that supply simulation software, and if you're not familiar with what simulation software is, don't worry, I'm gonna cover that as we go through it. But all ANSYS does is simulation software. They're not owned by a company that does other things, like, like some companies do everything, um, and others are CAD. Um, ANSYS just does simulation. They're, they're independent, and they're financially stable, and they don't care what CAD tool you use. The other last thing that you should know about ANSYS is that it's true multiple and multi-physics. So you can model electromagnetics, structures, thermal, vibration, fluid flow, piezoelectrics, all these crazy things that exist in the world from a physics standpoint we can do. So the products, I just kind of list them there, I won't go through those, but we do fluids. We have a whole suite of products for fluids, for structures. Uh, many of you are co contemplating probably a product that is more of an electronics device than a machine. So that's, that's still something that ANSYS dominates in. So making sure your signals are accurate, that you don't have a thermal problem, your, uh, you don't have radiation, your antenna works, and even down to the point of modeling in the Red Hot products, modeling the chips themselves within the product. We model things at a system level, and we also have a, a couple platforms that help us enable all these other tools. So um, all of these products are available through the startup program, which we'll talk about at the end. So a little bit about my company. We're called PADT, and what we do is help people develop physical products, so hardware. And uh, we do it by providing them with simulation, product development services, so we help design and test. We also do 3D printing and additive manufacturing. We're about 80 employees right now, actually, with offices here uh, based in Arizona in the United States, and with uh, sales and support in Colorado, New Mexico, Southern California, and Utah. So we're kind of spread out all over the place in the Western US. We're considered an elite ANSYS channel partner. We've been selling ANSYS for over 20 years. Uh, why I'm here today versus maybe another ANSYS reseller or somebody else is that we're very active in the startup community here in the southwestern U.S. Um, we're, we mentor. We're also angel investors. We invest through a group called Arizona Technology Investors. We have a facility at a local startup um, called CEI, and we have a facility there called Startup Labs where we go and help people do hardware design and simulation and 3D printing. And so uh, I also do mentoring, I'm on team committees and doing all sorts of stuff in the startup world. So um, it's, a, it's a special combination for me to be able to talk about startups and simulation. So two of my favorite things to talk about. So my background is uh, I'm one of the co-founders of the company. We started it in 94, and I'm also uh, considered a principal now. And we share ownership and leadership with two partners. So I've got uh, three of us around the company. I got my bachelor's in mechanical engineering at UC Berkeley in 19, I keep putting 96. It was actually 86. I don't know why I keep doing it. I'm old. <laughs> I'm 10 years older than that says. I graduated in 86. And I've been doing this a while. Uh, I've been writing software for 37 years. I started in high school. Uh, I've been using CAD. I started that in college for 33 years. And my first day as a graduate, when I went off to work at uh, Garrett Turbine Engine Company, I started using ANSYS 31 years ago, almost 32 now. Uh, 
Uh, my responsibilities here include running the engineering services department where we do simulation, product development, and medical devices. I also am in charge of marketing, IT, HR, administration, and facilities. So all this stuff that none of my partners really want to do. Um, I speak and write quite a bit on these topics. Uh, I'm a frequent blogger. Uh, I write articles uh, on all things technology, including simulation and 3D printing. Um, and uh, kind of all over all over the Southwest with that sort of stuff. And like I said, with the startup involvement, um, I do angel investing, I'm on screening committees, and I do judging and grants and things. So I'm that guy often on the other side of the table. So not only do I help customers, but I'm also the guy on the other side of the table. So that's a little bit about me and the companies. So let's get into the bulk of it. So hopefully we've got uh, everybody's uh, here now and we've got, got everybody uh, online with the slower internet and uh, let's talk about why we're here today. And I'm going to stick a stake in the ground. I don't know how many of you are from the U.S. You know this term, but we like to say we're going to we're going to make an important point. We're going to stick a stake stake in the ground, and we're going to make a statement that I strongly believe, and I and I challenge anybody to to, to say I'm wrong. And I feel that the proper use of simulation can make the difference between success and failure of your product startup. If you're doing a physical part, if you're doing hardware. And you're not using si simulation, you're really increasing your risks of failure. If you are using simulation, you're going to get to market faster and you're going to be more successful. And we'll talk about why that's true. But that's the whole basis of why we're here today. So the problem with startups is there's a lot of moving parts. So uh, I stole this from a presentation I do to uh, high school and college students about startups. And you know, what, what are you facing when you're a startup? You know, what you have to do is you have to define your problem. You have to come up with a solution. You can go raise money. You got to plan, design the pro product, raise more money, do testing, do marketing, get sales in order, raise more money, get your manufacturing going, do distribution, do support, and then make improvements to your product as you're more successful. So these are, you know, it's not always true for every hardware startup, but this is pretty much it uh, for most hardware startups. Simulation can really play an important role in the ones that just turn red. So in understanding what the problem really is, you can use simulation to test it on the computer. So that's what simulation really is, is using the computer to do virtual testing. So instead of going out and poking at something in a lab, you do it on the computer. Uh, finding your solution is often the most valuable part of simulation. So you've got some tough problem. There's a reason why somebody else hasn't solved it. You can use simulation to figure out how you can get it solved. Of course, in the design phase, that's the one everybody thinks of. As you're making your design, you use simulation. Um, testing can be one of the most expensive parts of the product development process for a startup. And if you can remove a lot of testing and make testing more successful, that's a huge benefit. And that's, that's a, a big uh, money saver that, that simulation can play. We can make pretty plots for marketing. We should never forget that. Uh, it can be very convincing to have that in there. When you get to manufacturing, simulation can also help you model your manufacturing processes. We've seen many products, not many, but we've seen a few products that are great, but the manufacturing process doesn't work. And so we use simulation to solve those problems. Once it's out in the field, if you have a failure, why did it fail? How do I fix it? And there's general improvements in, in the performance of your product. So using virtual testing or simulation can help every single one of these things. So we use computer models to drive the design. It is a standard practice out there. This is not a new thing. This is not, you're not out on the cutting edge. If you work for a large corporation that makes physical products, they use simulation. If they make aerospace or electronics products, it's required for them to use simulation. They, they can't. Uh, it's required by the government for aerospace and in electronics, it's just kind of a market-driven thing. You can't compete if you don't. And you study the behavior of your product on your computer. So I show these two products over here on the right. You know, we've come, this is not the earliest phone, but it was the best picture of an early phone I could find. And of course, our smartphones these days. Um, how do we get from point A to point B? Well, a lot of stuff happened um, to get to, you know, close to a cell phone. But once we got to packaging everything in such a small space, and with so much heat and so much power, uh, you know, running off a battery, we don't have power anymore, we have antennas, we have heat, we have people dropping them, we have all these different materials fitting together. This is a really tough problem to solve. This is a wood box with some wires in it. 
and, and, a, and a speaker and a microphone. This is a really tough problem to solve. And you can't get to a smartphone without simulation. The benefit is a lower cost, faster development, better product understanding, and of course, improved performance, which we're always looking for. So let's get in a little bit more depth as to what I'm talking about when I say simulation. I kind of throw that around there. And if anybody has any questions as I go through this, go ahead and uh, put them into the chat and I will um, stop and answer them when I get to a good point to do that. So let's see what simulation actually is. So the first definition is the act or process of simulating. So that's useless. The second, we don't like uh, a sham object a simulation. That's not what we're talking about today. The third definition in the dictionary is the one that we actually use. And it's the imita imitative representation of the functioning of one system or process by means of the functioning of another. As an example, a computer simulation of an industrial process. Right there is what we're talking about in the dictionary. We've made it. <laughs> simulation has made it. Um, and the other, the other, the B definition for that is examination of a problem often not subject to direct experimentation by means of a simulating device. And in this case, we're using a computer program to be that simulating device. So, so we're, that's that's really what we're talking about here. And specifically in engineering, we're using a mathematical system to represent the behavior of a physical system. So we're writing equations to predict behavior of what we're trying to understand. Um, and then we're solving these equations on a computer. And that, it, we do it a lot of different ways, but that basically is what, is it, what it is. And for physical product development engineering, the way we do it is we actually take these complex devices and we break them into discrete uh, chunks, we call them elements actually. And we can write equations for a little little brick. We can't write equations for say, uh, let's say you've got a new electric bicycle, right? And you want to model the frame. We can't really write an equation for the frame of that bicycle, especially if it's composite. But what we can do is we can break it up into little chunks and write equations for each of those chunks. We assemble those equations and we solve them. And we call this mathematics, nine times out of 10, we're using a process called finite element analysis. We're breaking things into finite elements. Sometimes we break them into, into a different set of equations and we use finite difference to solve it, or we write equations on the surface and we use boundary elements, or we work with volumes, which is finite volume. They're all kind of the same thing of breaking things into chunks. And I got a great question. Why not simulation? Why not use simulation for software as well? We actually do do that. And in fact, in the hardware space, the software you want to simulate is your control software. And I'm actually going to talk about a product uh, that you can get access to through the program that offers that kind of simulation. <coughs> <coughs> Excuse me. So it's a software tool. And it's a standard commercial software tool. We're not talking crazy academic or open source stuff that you download off the internet. It's well established, it's robust, it's supported, and it's efficient. It works with up and downstream software, so it's not doesn't work isolated. It reads geometry, it outputs information to manufacturing, it does all sorts of great stuff. And it should have a look and feel, and we're pretty good about that this, these days. It is similar to what you're used to from your CAD package or other engineering software tools. Simulation is, of course, taught in engineering schools, and uh, ANSYS is the most commonly taught one. And it runs on standard computer hardware. You know, you don't have to go out and buy a $4 million computer to run this stuff. It, it, it's nice if you can afford that. But as a startup, you can get a pretty, you can get a decent high-end machine to run these things on. Uh, and the more horsepower you have, the faster it runs. Uh, the big change for me since I started using it over 30 years ago is how easy it is to learn, use, and remember. This was really an expert tool 30 years ago. And about 10 years ago, I think it kind of made that transition to something that you can pick up. Uh, you have to do some training, learn it. But if you walk away from it from six months and come back, it'll still make sense to you. And it's constantly evolving and improving. It's not stagnant in any way. And the other thing to think about is often we come to the table with our own biases. Like, I'm a mechanical engineer, so I always think about, you know, stress and vibration. But these things can model any physics. Antenna design with electromagnetics, motor design with electromagnetics, fluid flow, microfluidics, piezoelectrics, all these crazy physics and the interaction between them can be written as equations across discrete objects and then assembled and solved. 
So what we're really talking about is replacing testing. And for me, uh, this plot over on the right, which is a few years old now, it's, it's quite a bit old, it's 2014. Um, to me, I felt like, wow, we really have made it. If you can do one of the most difficult simulations, which is crashing a complete car, not just the body, we, we were doing bodies years and years ago, but this is a complete car with the engine, the suspension, and everything, and crash it into an object and get it to match this closely with the actual test, we've really arrived. So I like people who aren't simulation people or not necessarily even engineers to think of simulation as replacing testing. When you think about, well, where is this going to fit into my product development process? How is this going to help me get my product to market faster? It's going to replace testing for you. Um, you. You do testing because you want to get information. You want to understand your product and if it will perform. And we can use simulation to do that. And why do it instead of testing? Well, it's faster, it's cheaper, it gives you more insight, and there's about a dozen other reasons why. But the big ones are those three. Uh, you can save a lot of money, um, you can get there much faster, and you can understand what's going on much, much better. Uh, like I've talked about already, it has a very broad application. It's, it's math, right? So it works on full multi-physics. So the big ones are stress, temperature, and fluid flow. Uh, what we're seeing more and more as we get more and more electronics packed into smaller and smaller places and everything has an antenna is high frequency electromagnetics. Uh, we can model chemical reactions, impact cracking, shattering, metal forming. Uh, the controls that run your object, that can also be simulated. And the software and user interface for your product can also be put into a simulation environment. So you need to think about uh, it from a system level down to the component level. So we can model that whole thing. If it's a physical behavior, it can be modeled. So that's what simulation is kind of in a nutshell, kind of getting to the gist of it. Let's talk about driving your product development with simulation. So the term driving is intentional, right? And we have another example here over on the right. We went, I actually found the first car. So this is the original, uh, uh, was it Mercedes or Benz? I forget which one of those two made the first car. Um, and th that's it right there, pretty basic device. Um, uh, hopefully all of us with some technical background could, could probably build this ourselves today. Now we can get to the most advanced, which is Lucid, which is kind of the biggest competitor I, th I feel to, to Tesla right now. It's a fully electric luxury vehicle. And um, we, we went through a lot of steps along that way. Um, and one of the things that's changed is we now drive our design not with test, but with simulation. We're not steering or informing, we're pushing it forward. We're, we're pushing the design with simulation. So what's design? Um, this is a list of what I want the product to do. And then you come up with a configuration that does what I want and then you make sure it does what you want, right? If you really think about what you're doing when you're designing a product, this is what I want it to do. This is the thing that I think is gonna be able to do it. This is the physical gizmo that I think is gonna get me there. Now I need to make sure it works. And what simulation does, it says, well, what can it do? What can we actually get done? What, what, what is possible, physically possible for the product to do? Um, and what works well and what does not work well within that product design and, um, and then, of course, the final question is, does it do what I want? And you get it done, you can actually test in the computer and drive your design that way. So let's talk about, if you remember back at the beginning, I talked about the, the things you have to do as a startup that were impacted. So the problem, you need to understand your problem, and you can understand it much more deeply. The solution, um, you may only have an idea of how to solve the problem, um, and it's not been proven. So you can use simulation to really understand that solution. Um, the design portion is the same for any product development process. Um, the thing about a startup that's different and why it's important to have simulation is you don't have 20 years of product data to go off of. You're not just improving a widget or, or putting in a new box, adding a new feature. Um, you're starting from scratch. So you got nothing to go on. So the more you can simulate, the better off you are. Testing is also the same for standard products, but again, you don't have that previous information. You don't have test data from the past. Marketing, um, you know, not only, uh, we tend to think about marketing and simulation and that we can make these really cool plots and animations, which is very useful. 
But the other thing that we found it even more useful for is really nailing down those differentiators early in the process. You know, why, if you, if you think about it from a startup standpoint, and as an as a investor and a screener of startups, the question I always ask is, how do you differentiate yourself from your competitors? What makes you so special? And uh, a lot of times people don't know because they have to build it and test it to make sure. They kind of think they know what's, they, they've guessed what it is, but they don't know why it's better. Um, they hope it's better in these ways. If you use simulation, you can go to people, investors and early customers and say, look, um, I know I haven't built this yet and tested it, but my simulation tells me that A, B, and C are far better than the competition. This really helps with marketing to, to investors. Of course, manufacturing for you as a startup is a complete unknown. You don't, you don't, no one's ever made what you've invented before. So you can avoid problems by using simulation. Out there in the field, you don't have a lot of data. So when you're providing support, you can actually use simulation. And I'm not going to get into it, but the whole idea of digital mock-ups and um, using digital twins to create a, a support model is something that we're seeing more and more of out there. And, and you'll see more and more of that in the future. And then, of course, once you have your product, you're making money, everybody loves you, you're on the cover of Inc. Magazine or Bloomberg, and uh, you need to make a new product and improve on it. Simulation is the best way to actually see where can I make, make changes and make this better. So the key thing that we're trying to do here is know uh, before we have hardware. So you may, you may think, if, you, if you're not familiar with this whole process, the modern product development process, you may be rushing to get to physical prototype. Um, which is good. You need to get there quick because it's easier to get to your next round of investment, but it takes time. It takes a long time to get there. And the most expensive thing you can do is change the design late in the process. So you want to, this is a very common curve. Uh, there's a lot of different versions of it, but you know, the impact of innovation is extremely high uh, early in the time period. And then the cost of change gets higher as you get further along. So if you're tweaking and modifying your model or down here, it doesn't cost you very much and it has a huge impact. If you're changing it down here, man, it's going to cost you a fortune. Um, so you want to make sure you modify and change your design early on. Um, if you are in manufacturing, you have to redo tooling, you probably need more money. And, and we have customers this, that deal with this all the time. You know, we help startup companies with manufacturing and they'll come to us, the tooling's done, we're ready to go into production in China and they found out they have to make a design change. And there's another 50 to $100,000 in tooling they have to go through. So the earlier a problem is found and changed, the better. And using simulation, you can get there faster and you don't have to wait on hardware to test things. Also, the other benefit is understanding your product. So, so when you do a test, often the only thing you know is, well, we passed. Simulation can, can, can really get in there and dig around and understand why. It, it, it lets you see the numbers inside and lets you see it over time. The other thing to really think about, and if you're new to simulation or, or new to product development at a, from an engineering standpoint, um, one of the things we like to understand is the sensitivity of drivers in our design. So if I always think about it as a black box, and I got knobs in the box, and of course I've got a dial, and I want my dial to be in a certain place. Well, which knobs have the biggest effect? Because I want to focus on those. I want to make sure that they're, they're good. I want to make sure that I have them in the right place. The, the other thing you may be doing is trying to figure out, is feature A or feature B the most beneficial for, for performance? Because you may not be able to afford both. So make that decision early on. Also, what geometric features impact the characteristics the most? Um, we had a, a very experienced customer, not a startup at all, come in with a product that had a, had a heat problem, and they didn't really look at it early on from a, a thermal standpoint. They could have simulated it before they went to hardware. What they ended up doing is getting down the manufacturing process, having a heat problem because they didn't understand how important their geot this one geometric feature was to getting the heat away from the electronics. Um, so that's a great real world example of that. Um, so I have a question. What gets input into a simulation? For a physical product, it seems obvious to input some laws of physics, but when you're talking about using simulation for marketing, where does the, well, I'm not really, okay, so that's a good question. Um, when you're talking about using 
marketing, I'm still talking about modeling the physical behavior. I'm not modeling the marketing process. Now, there are tools to do that out there. I don't know how good they are because to me, marketing is black magic. So, <laughs> but what we're doing is answering questions about the product's performance. So we're still answering physics questions. We're still, we still want to know, um, let, let me make up an up a product. Maybe I've got a smart watch that sits on my wrist and I want it to um, talk to the local cell phone network. So I want to design an antenna that's better than everybody else's antenna. And in order to test that, it's going to take me six months to get a qualified, get it there and test it. I could probably do that in a week in simulation. And I can go and I can model the competitor's antenna, and I can model my antenna, and I can go to investors uh, and early customers and say, my antenna is 50% better than the existing antenna. So that's the kind of stuff you can do from a marketing standpoint which is a great segue into minimum viable product. So you should all be familiar with this. If you're new to startups, one of the things we really stress is don't try and do a product that does everything. Figure out what's the feature list that is a minimum possible number of features that I can go to market with. It's a minimum viable product. And it's really successful. It's really important to the success of your product. And we can help you through simulation figure out what is that list of features. So you may have 30 features. You can test them virtually and decide, well, what's the impact of these 30 features? What three features do I really need? Also, you can look at how difficult it would be to get those features in there. So you may want this feature, but it's going to cost you a million dollars to get there. Mm, let's stick with the one that costs 200000 and then the other thing that we see sometimes is the impact of one feature on another. These, these capabilities in your product may interact, so we can model that. If, if I add feature D, feature A and B stop working, ooh, that's really bad. So take D out. So one of the things we can do with simulation is determine if the product meets the minimum performance goals with a minimum feature set. So we can answer those questions about what my MVP is using simulation. Um, and, and having a tool is just the first step. Um, to be successful, you have to have the right tool, which means um, you need to have something that's not free or CAD-based. So a lot of you may be tempted to go and, and download a, uh, a free open source tool or maybe get something from the university that's kind of a student version. Um, those usually don't cut it. The other thing is you want to get a tool that meets your long-term needs. You need something that grows with you. And you need a tool that doesn't limit you. You don't want a tool that holds you back from you, what your product can do. The other thing you need is a user. Um, a lot of times what we'll see is uh, a startup will say, okay, well, I want to use ANSYS. And uh, John over here, um, you know, my cousin who's helping us with this startup, he took a class his freshman year and they used ANSYS for two weeks. Well, that's, that's a good start, but, but you really need uh, somebody that, that, that understands engineering and understands simulation. So uh, we recommend you pay for experience or get mentoring. Um, knowing how to run the program is just one ask. In fact, these programs are really easy to use. You don't need a lot of training to know how to run the program. What you need to do is know how to run the program correctly. So how to use simulation is the thing that you need an experienced engineer for. And then you need a good support provider. Um, and that, if you're a startup, you're going to need a lot of support, let's be honest. Um, unless one of the people on your team is a very experienced user of simulation, you're going to need some help. And you need a support provider that's not just going to say, here's your free software, or here's your cheap software that came with your CAD package, and here's someplace you can log in on the internet and ask questions. You need somebody that's going to pick up the phone and when you call and ask you, now what are you really trying to do? What is the question you're trying to answer? And why do you need to know? And then help you figure out how to use simulation to answer that question. And last, you need an implementation plan. Everything you do in a startup needs an implementation plan, and this is, this is nothing different. You should have a product development process mapped out. If you don't, uh, you probably will stumble. So make sure you have one mapped out, and make sure that simulation is part of that mapped out process. And last, and the hardest, and the one you were probably hoping I wouldn't mention, is you need enough funding. Um, you, you, just, you just need a lot of funding to do this stuff. Um, hardware is, um, you know, it takes, it takes time and it takes money. You need, to, you need to have enough money to buy 
the software that we're talking about, which ANSYS really helps by discounting heavily. You need hardware to run it on, you need people, you need training, and you need to implement it. So in your funding, when you go out there and you're, you're raising money, simulation should be part of your product development process and it should be part of your budget. So when people are doing a deep dive and doing due diligence on your company, if an engineer like me is looking at it and he sees that you budgeted for simulation, we're going to really, really like that. That means you know what you're doing. So any questions before I get into some success stories about what simulation is and how you use it and why it's of benefit? Give a few seconds here. Okay. We'll go right into success stories then. So uh, Velux Motorsports is a, a great success story. So they make aftermarket components for automobiles. They're high performance uh, automobile parts. So uh, maybe a new uh, rear end bumper or spoiler for, uh, I think this is a Mazda, I think, RX, or Mazda Miata, maybe it's not. Um, uh, all sorts of weird uh, suspension parts and things. They make a lot of really cool things. Um, that can really, really have a big impact on the performance of your car. And they decided that since aerodynamics is really important, that they would take a look at ANSYS CFD. So they got the startup package and they got in there and instead of literally building stuff, duct taping it onto cars and driving around, they would stick yarn onto the car to see what the, what the and, and try and videotape it from a car driving next to it. Because um, they're, they're small, right? They don't have a, they don't have a wind tunnel. <laughs> they don't have access to it. Um, and they can't afford to build multiple models and pay for the wind tunnel. So they, they were doing on-car testing, and it was really hard to get useful data out of that. Um, and it, it was a really good uh, uh, switch for them to go to CFD. And, and the quote is really good. It's proven to be a superior tool um, from what they were doing before. And it sped up their capability and improved their accuracy. Of course, they had that support provider, ourselves, PADT, in helping them get up to, to speed and running. Um, so they wouldn't be where they are today if it wasn't for PADT and ANSYS. They liked it so much that they went and added on the structural package as well so they could look at some of the structural components. Uh, and it's been very good. So the question I'm getting, which is, which is an important question, is how much does this cost? Um, the, the pricing, I, I have to give ANSYS some comment. I'll, I'll skip ahead. I have a slide on this, but I know you guys want to know. Um, I think ANSYS is being really... Um, What's the what's right term? They're making an investment in this. They realize that startups don't have a lot of money. So some do, some don't. So the pricing is based, basically based upon how much money you have. So when you call up your local ANSYS representative, whether that's a reseller or a direct person, they're going to ask you questions about the financial position of your company. Um, we've, we've sold it to a, to a very early stage startup that could use the software. For, for less than their computer cost. I don't want to give prices because people hold you to prices, but they paid more for their computer than they paid for ANSYS. Um, well-established, very well-funded startups out of, uh, say, Silicon Valley, you know, they're, they're paying a significant amount of money, um, but, but still about a quarter of the full price of the product. So it's not out of reach. It's, it's, it's what you can afford is the question that we've been told is sell it for what the customer can afford. So it's not free, but free stuff never works. So there's no such thing as free lunch. There's no such thing as free simulation software, but uh, this is going to be uh, what you can afford. So that's, a, that's kind of a wishy-washy political question or answer to your question, but um, that's the reality of it. It's what you can afford. Um, let me talk about another one of my favorite customers, Worldview. So what Worldview is doing is um, they're taking uh, high altitude balloons and putting payloads underneath them. Uh, one of their payloads is going to be, the thing I'm really excited about is basically a bar, um, a cafe. And so it's going to be a small cafe that you can go up and you can see the curvature of the earth and see how it rate, how, it, how, how you can see uh, basically almost in space while you have a nice meal and a drink. I'm very excited about that. Uh, more practically, um, they're making payloads for uh, observation of various kinds of communication of various kinds. Um, the the uh, product is very disruptive uh, in the space technology because you don't have a rocket anymore. So they want to, they call their, they call their payload the stratolite because it goes in the stratosphere and it's a satellite, so stratolite. And they want it to be robust and durable. 
and they have a very broad range of missions. They're, they have so many different applications for this. So they used ANSYS structural and dynamic analysis to optimize their design. So this is what their final part looked like. So they got a ton of weight out of this thing. They really did a good job on it. So they've been working with us for a long time, for years, um, and, and they still got the discount. They, they're not a new startup. They're, they're established startup, but uh, you know, they paid what they could afford. Um, and we gave them a lot of support. Um, they've been instrumental in helping the, the software has been really uh, instrumental in helping them get through their launch, uh, flying through and coming back uh, to the earth from their journey to the, to the stratosphere. So it's been a really, really good uh, product for them. It's really, they can't afford to test this. It's huge. And, and tests cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So I have a question. Uh, how about building and doing the simulation? Do you offer doing these services. We don't have a team to do all this right now, but it's surely very useful. What do you need a 3D model? Really good fundamental question. I should have covered that. Um, yeah, what you need is geometry. You need a 3D model. Uh, we can, of course, build that for you. And there's, there's uh, service providers all over the world that can help you. Uh, you can outsource the building, running, or post-processing, any of those steps to somebody. Um, but yeah, you basically need your CAD model. So you need a basic CAD model, and that's our starting point. You need to know what materials it's made out of, and you need to know what the loads are that it's going to see. So let's take this worldview part for an example. Um, it's made out of uh, aluminum, so they need the aluminum material properties. They had their geometry shape, and then they had the flight profile. So the loads that it saw as it went up, and then also the biggest load, this is what we're looking at, is when it, when it lands hard. So what's the worst case landing scenario? What's the acceleration that it sees? Um, so pretty, pretty straightforward to do all that, very standard for the industry. But yeah, you do need to have those things. And there are people that can help with that as a service. Some other examples, because you don't have a huge amount of time. Uh, one of the ones I also would like to try out, uh, I love using products that use simulation. Uh, Nebbia, this, this is a classic thing. I mean, how many of us stand in the shower every day and go, there's got to be a better shower head? This is such a wasteful shower head. Well, these guys actually did something about it. Um, so they have a low water use, high performance shower head. And what they're basically doing is misting the water out of there. So they wanted to actually drive the design. So remember, we're talking about driving design by shaping the nozzles and the water delivery into the plenum that goes into the nozzles so that they got this really nice particle size and the, the I don't want to call it a cloud, but the, the mass of droplets that comes out of that nozzle stays together and holds its heat. So if you get too much space in between those droplets, it cools off too fast. So the whole sense you're looking for is that feel of warm water on your skin, right? So they, they achieved that using uh, Fluent, ANSYS Fluent, and got a 70% water savings and a 10% increase in water contact by using simulation. Can you imagine how many of these things they would have had to build trial and error to figure that out? And, and I like this plot over here on the right, because if you're not an engineer, not a, not a simulation CFD kind of guy, you don't necessarily know what this means. But this is the kind of data you can get. If I look at a picture, I can't see what's the thermal distribution, what's the temperature across that, that stream. I can't really see that in this picture, but I can see it in the simulation. And that's the kind of answers they got. Mohi Lab, Mo Mohi, I never, I think it's Mohi Labs. Um, they're also looking at doing something different, right? So drones are a big thing right now. Um, the, one of the problems with drones is they've got uh, propellers, right? We've got a, a technology that the Wright brothers kind of perfected uh, back in the, the turn of the century. So the last century. <laughs> so they're looking at, at what happens if I stick an impeller inside? And basically it's like a jet ski, right? The way a jet ski works is it uses an impeller rather than a propeller. So what if I do that with air? So they want to build a bladeless drone. And they drove their whole design before they built anything through simulation. And then they used 3D printing straight from the models to verify their tests. And they, and they made changes to the complex uh, physics that they were trying to create, um, just totally looking at what's going on inside the parts using simulation. Uh, on the medical side of things, we have a company called Neograft, which is a polymer scaffold for heart bypass veins. So, you know, they take, they take the vein out of your leg and they, they bring it up and put it on your heart and they need something to hold it so that it, that it grows and does well. 
And you know, you can't test that stuff. Uh, even if you are testing and say for a heart, we often use a pig to do a human analogy. It's still a lot of work and very expensive to do that. So they actually did it um, using uh, simulation, and what they found was the most useful part was they could iterate on the design very quickly. So they could make changes to the design without having to go back into the test and see what it did. And then Bragi uh, is, uh, it looks like a hearing aid down here in the lower right, but what it actually is is an in-ear personal assistant. So it's like Siri in your ear. And it allowed them to do all these, you know, they're packaging a huge amount of electronics in that tiny little earpiece. So how do you solve that problem? You solve it with simulation. And it, and it went very well for them. So I have another, another question. Uh, another question. Can you simulate, based on certain 3D models, define which model uses um, the least material so it's most cost-effective to manufacture the product? Yes. So when we talk about that, we call it optimization. And shape optimization is actually the term we use. And um, the two criteria we often use for shape optimization are reducing cost and reducing weight. So if you are not an aerospace application or an application where weight is important, we take that one out of the equation, but we're always left with manufacturing cost. And so we write an equation that we put into the optimization that looks at material cost per pound, basically, or per per uh, kilo, for those of you not in the US. <laughs> and um, also, we can look at certain characteristics that drive manufacturing cost, like say wall thickness or um, you know certain certain things we know are going to drive my cost up, and we'll put that into the into the model that we run the optimization on, and then we iterate using the computer, uh, make a change to the design, see what that result is, see how it impacts cost of manufacturing. So that's that's really really a very common thing that we do. Um, and it's it's something we do like it's like someone else pointed out is it's something we do not just with structural but with fluids uh, and electromagnetics uh, we've we've seen a couple of really nice antenna designs that we've done and waveguides and the electromagnetic side of things um, where we've reduced the cost significantly of the material needed uh, using simulation. So hopefully I've gotten you re to realize that. If you want to be successful, you should really take a look at simulation. So what's your next steps? Um, so the, the first ones are really quantify your product performance goals. You, you, you really, you know, simulation is a, is a vast tool. It does so many different things. So you really understand, well, what am I trying to achieve? Am I trying to solve a thermal problem? Am I worried about it failing in the field? Is there a performance characteristic that I need? Like maybe, you're, maybe you have a speaker and it needs to be a certain loudness. Well, we can model that, right? So what loudness do you need it to be? Once you've identified what your performance goals are, you can then step back and go, okay, simulation can help me with this one. Simulation can help me with that one. This tool can help with this one. Also, and, and then you should do this anyway, even if you're not going to use simulation, is fully map out your failure modes. So where could my device fail? How is it going to, this is a standard engineering practice, right? How is it going to go wrong? Now, once you've done that, let me see if I can use simulation to predict that failure and push it out as far as I can or eliminate the possibility completely. Third thing is testing. Part of your product development process should include testing of your product. And then, so you want to use simulation. You want to you know, then take a look at that. Well, these are the 22 tests I need to do. Okay, guys, let's get in a room and figure out which of these 22 tests I can eliminate and use simulation instead. Or... Your goal of testing, because it's so expensive, is to just pass, right? So you may still have to do three tests, but let's make sure we model those tests beforehand and we pass them. Um, now it's time, now that you've identified the kind of, these are basically, you're going to use simulation for goals, to avoid failures, and to minimize the cost of tests. Now you know what you need to simulate. Now you can find a tool, a user, and a support provider based on this information. Go ahead and create your product development plan, and, and part of that is going to be an implementation plan for simulation. And then like everything else, uh, you execute and you improve, right? Engineering is about taking data and improving your process as you go. So these are really what I recommend as the first steps. And then I recommend you take a look at the ANSYS startup program. So we talked a little bit about this because I know you guys want to know what this costs.
So you're not going to find any tool set that's as full featured or capable. This is the full ANSYS product. This is the this is the product that, um, you know, I believe it's now 19 of the top 20 Dow Jones industrial companies use. I think Google is now using it because they're getting it into hardware now. Um, so this this is this is what everybody uses, and this is the same product that you can get as a startup. It's full physics and true multi physics. Um, it's the one that's used more than any other tool. Why do you care about that? Well, finding a cousin that actually knows ANSYS, if, if you're from a nerdy family like I am, isn't going to be so hard, right? Everybody's got knows somebody somewhere, maybe three times removed, knows an ANSYS user because it is so well used. Um, the startup program is very affordable, and you get the full function product. We're not giving you a dumbed down product. This is full ANSYS capability, and like I said, when I say affordable, I mean it's what you can afford. So we need to uh, de define what you can afford, and that's what the price is. And the other great thing is you're not going to have to switch tools if your company grows. I shouldn't say if. When your company grows and you're successful and your product needs grow, you can stay with ANSYS. In fact, that's the, one of the number one reasons why uh, we've had customers sign up with the startup program, at least for us because they can sometimes get this stuff free from other vendors. And they looked at it and they go, that's great, but in two years, we're going to be in full production and we need full answers. We can't do what we need to do using this free tool. Um, so we're going to go ahead and invest now, use it early, get to know it, make it part of our process and grow with it. Uh, it's supported by world-class engineers, uh, people like PADT. Uh, the support staff at ANSYS is incredible if, you, if you're buying it direct from them. Um, it is not go to a forum and ask a question. You get a real engineer on the phone that understands your problems. Um, and we have, the other thing is, don't be scared that this is going to be some high-end, you have to have a PhD to use it. We have tools for every level of user, um, and you don't give up functionality for it, of it. Um, I really highly recommend you take a look at the An Google ANSYS Discovery and take a look at the videos of that product. That's our newest product. It's actually in beta right now. It's real-time simulation right there on your CAD model. You don't have to even mesh it. It does all that for you. You just specify the materials, the loads, and you want to know the stresses, boom, it's done. So it can answer some very early, easy questions in your product development process, and we can go all the way its tools. Um, so every level of user is carried, it's taken care of. So what I really recommend, and somebody gave me a great lead into this question, uh, where can I find more information on the 300 startups that you mentioned? Go to ansys.com slash startup. Uh, many of them are listed there. Um, and I've got another question here. Uh, structure engineer, I want to code a tool that uses ANSYS engine and optimizes something. I do not need extensive multi or whatever. Uh, we also support startups who make software based on ANSYS engine. Yes. So you... Uh, if, if what you're talking about is actually using ANSYS as the engine for your product, uh, we, have a, we have a couple startups that do that. Um, and we can probably talk more. Uh, so, Yejeter? Yejeter is your name, I think? Where are you from? And what I would ask is that you talk to the local ANSYS folks there, and they can tell you in much greater detail um, I don't know how much you know about how you do that, but you can you can open up a TCP IP port into ANSYS as a solver anywhere in the world and send commands back and forth to it. Um, it, it can be compiled and linked into your code. It's a fully open, fully open code. Um, so what you're trying to do is something people do all the time using ANSYS as an engine. So um, we, we'd love to, uh, see, I guessed it was Turkish. I used to live in Turkey as a kid, but I didn't want to, embarrassed myself by guessing. Um, <laughs> um, so you want to use APDL, you know what you're talking about. Um, my email address, I'm not sure if it was on here, is, let me type it in. Uh, so email me directly if you have any questions, highly technical questions like that. And if I can't answer them, I'll find somebody that can at padtinc.com. Um, and I'll, I'll give you some examples, some blog articles we've written about exactly what you're trying to do. Um, so the meshing part, uh, I've got another question. Uh, I know that ANSYS has meshing part. What is the capability of that? I mesh human vessels and the mesh with this to be structural mesh. Yes. So um, we have a, a really good mesher for biological objects. 
you can import um, a faceted model. So one of the problems when you're modeling human vessels is you don't necessarily have a CAD model, right? You don't have a, a, a NER, what we call NURB geometry. The math behind the CAD model is NURBs. You probably have a CAT scan or a point cloud that you've skinned and have triangles on the surface of. We can mesh those. Uh, so we can work very, very easily with those. Um, and and I, we, we're actually doing a model just like that right now for a customer here uh, in Arizona um, that's, that's making uh, uh, I can't tell you what it is, not anything about it. But it involves, it's a, it's a medical device that sits in a human vessel, and we do model those vessels uh, quite sophisticated. Uh, it, it does not have to be a structured mesh unless you need it to be. Uh, on the CFD side, if you're doing fluid flow, um, sometimes you need a structured mesh, and we can force that in, a, in geometry like that. But um, there's a lot of different, the structural part of a, of a vessel. Um, and to be honest with you, the difficult part is getting the right material properties. Um, and there's some really good um, uh, papers out there if you search for ANSYS material properties for vessels and arteries. Um, that, that's a, it's a highly nonlinear material. This, it's a great question because it really gets into why ANSYS and not some of these other products. What you're talking about is a highly nonlinear uh, elastic behavior of, of the vessel itself. It doesn't act like uh, normal material, like metal. So it's a nonlinear material property. The startup package comes with the full nonlinear capability, so you can put in those nonlinear material properties. Um, oh, I put it to the panelists, not to everybody. All attendees. <laughs> I sent my email address just to one person. <laughs> Hopefully you can all see that now. So, um, you know, do, do send me any specific questions and I'll try and connect you with the right people. Um, and, you know, go to the ANSYS.com startup uh, page. There's a form there. Rather than trying to figure out who you should talk to, um, what I recommend you do is just fill out the form and say you're interested in the startup program. It will get registered and your local salesperson will uh, immediately contact you, hopefully within a day or two, I should say immediately. I always tell my sales guys that it should be immediate, but uh, within a day or two, they'll get back to you. Um, and, and they're very versed in the startup program as well as, uh, that'll be another, uh, if you've dealt with software sales people before, ANSYS software salespeople understand not only the product, like how to do simulation, but they understand how you as users use the product to drive your design. So it's, it's a very pleasant sales experience, I've been told. All right, we've got like two more minutes. Anybody else have any more questions? I do, let me put in my, my blog as well. Um, if you, uh, it's a great place to poke around looking for ANSYS stuff. Um, highly recommend it. You can also find out more information about us there. Um, there's some, some also additional information on the startup program on the blog. Um, there's also, if, you're, if, you, if any of your startups involve 3D printing, we haven't talked about that at all today. Um, that's the other thing we do here. So um, there's some great information about simulation and 3D printing on the blog. Okay. Um, and and your, your question about the meshing, do, do email me and I can give you some specific uh, contacts at ANSYS of people that, are, that uh, their medical person um, works with companies that are meshing uh, biological objects all the time. So I'll put you in touch with him. 